Okay, Cindy, you can start. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today at Cambridge Zero Climate Change Festival. Um, my name is Cindy Ford. Um, I'm the founder of Planetary, which is an education company that's pioneering learning in line with the UN SDGs. So it's my great pleasure to moderate the Pioneers panel with a remarkable lineup of human beings, Tyson, Christine and Angus, who are working on pioneering systems and ways of being that set out pathways to a better world. Today is... Remembrance Day, so it's a day to honour remarkable human beings who sacrifice their lives for a better world. I'd certainly like to honour them this morning. My own grandfather served in World War I as a boy soldier, and in World War II he survived four years as a prisoner of war. Um, as this is a pioneers panel, I'd also like us to extend, ask us to extend that remembrance to the millions of people who lost their lives in the march of this current civilization, to whom there are no, there are as yet, no international commemorative days or memorials. The millions of indigenous people who were killed in the colonization of Australia, New Zealand, America, and the millions of enslaved people who were the human backbone of this economic system. So as we work to find solutions for a collective humanity, we perhaps need ways of collectively acknowledging our interconnected past, the glorious that we are very proud to remember and the inglorious that we would rather forget. And by honouring all members of the human family, perhaps we will then be able fully to share and integrate the different pieces of the puzzle that we hold in understanding how to shape our world. And from this build a harmonious whole grounded, for all, grounded in respect for all lives and all life on our incredible planet. And this is the common theme of our panelists today. We'll be hearing from Tyson Yonker Porter. Tyson is an academic thinker, artist and writer. He's senior lecturer in Indigenous Knowledges at Deakin University in Melbourne and author of the brilliant Sand Talk, How Indigenous People, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. Um, we'll be hearing from Christine McDougall. Christine is Chief Steward at Centropic World, which is inspired by the work of Buckminster Fuller. And in Centropic, in the Centropic world, rather than trying to fix the old models that are broken, it's about creating new models, new maps, new mindsets for a world with a future, including legal governance, accounting, value, provisioning and enterprise design. And well, in, in the, um, our third speaker on the panel will be Angus, Angus Forbes. Angus follows a 20 year career in the city um, by becoming, he became um, the director of the Rainforest Trust. He then founded Bankers Without Boundaries, which is a not-for-profit helping to get private capital into high impact projects. And more recently, he founded the Global Planet Authority, which is a not-for-profit that advocates humanity's entrance into global governance above the nation state to create one authority that has the power to ensure biophysical integrity for the planet. And this is Angus's book, which is called Global Planet Authority. So Tyson, Christine and Angus will each give an overview of their remarkable work and then we'll move to a panel discussion with questions from, from you, our audience. Um, I should warn the audience that this is an all Aussie panel and um, I have had assurances that re references to crushing um, sporting defeats on this side of the pond will be kept to a minimum. So without further ado, thank you so much again for joining us. And um, Tyson, it's um, your opening our session for today. So I'll hand over to you. No worries. Uh, it's really good to be here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm speaking from um, Melbourne at the moment. Um, yeah, and this is on the um, uh, Bunurong country here. And there's lots of sweet um, underground water nearby and that's running. Uh, a lot of it used to be above ground. Now it's underground. There's a lot of concrete and um, <clears throat> bitumen and buildings over the top, but it's still there and you can feel it beneath your feet. Um, I'm a long way from home. Um, I belong to the Upledge clan from uh, Western Cape York, which is 3000 <laughs> kilometers north. Um, yeah, but uh, I've got connections uh, all over, uh, cultural and ancestral connections, lots of different places on this continent. And I spend, until this year, I've spent a lot of time, um, you know, going around and working in 
lots of different communities and I've spent, you know, many decades just um, out on country and watching the changes, particularly over the last 30 years, you know, um, I know a few years back, I went back to a place in rainforest. I hadn't been since I was about 13 years old and, and it had changed significantly. You know, it was still a rainforest. It still had all the trees and plants still in place. Um, but it was silent, you know, the birds weren't there. And, you know, the fish in, in the stream that I remember just being thick with fish. Um, I searched all day and I, I only found one eel and that eel was blind. <laughs> and so, you know, um, things have changed. Uh, human beings as a custodial species, that's our ecological niche, you know, and we're not there. And as you know, when an ecological niche is, you know, emptied, we're not out there on, on this land anymore. Uh, we're all kind of, you know, funneled into these little settlements. And so we're not out on the land and the land needs us. Uh, it, it, needs, it needs us there fulfilling our role as a custodial species. So, you know, just that alone has caused a lot of problems, but there are heaps of problems. Uh, one of those is climate change, but there's about 20 uh, pretty pressing existential threats at the moment um, going on around the world. Um, my, uh, I did a book what uh, over a year ago now um, about this, and this is how fast things are moving. At the time when I wrote the book, um, the biggest criticism of it, you know, in, in the editing process and everything else was that it's a little bit chicken little, you know, you kind of say in the sky is falling in and, you know, it's like, well, I don't, we don't think it is, you know, it's, it's, it's not as hopeless as all that. <laughs> um, you know, cause I was predicting all kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, it, all of a sudden, um, my book was pretty mild. <laughs> so, I mean, just 12 months later, people were reading that book and it was giving them hope. I was sort of thinking that was a pretty optimistic vision of the world. So, you know, a lot can change in 12 months. And I think uh, we're going to see that escalating and snowballing just faster and faster. This next decade is going to be huge. Australia famously likes to dig its way out of... Um, you know, recessions and economic difficulties. So I think a 10 year depression is going to need a lot of digging. We're going to need to be uh, sending vast quantities of ore out. And that doesn't bode well for a lot of things, uh, particularly at a time when, um, you know, China has been limiting, you know, gradually its production of um, uh, rare earth metals, you know, the ones we need for our solar panels that are supposedly <laughs> renewable, um, clean energy um yeah we need all that rare earth ore and um that needs to be refined in such a way that produces radioactive waste that needs to be stored somewhere and china can't be taking that one for the team forever um so yeah there's lots of rare earth mines uh opening up in australia um now and and so we're going to be copying a lot of that over the next uh the next decade um so yeah the book my book was talking about how um you know, it wasn't talking, you're offering, you know, solutions and you need to do this and you need to do that. And it wasn't just offering, you know, platitudes and acknowledgements of, well, you know, Aboriginal people have lived sustainably for 60,000 plus years, you know, so we should talk to them about it, which is always done. And we're always acknowledged. And then, you know, somebody will, you know, offer a couple of stories or something, you know, there'll be a little dance or something like that. And then, um, <laughs> but the actual knowledge doesn't come in and it's not information that you need from us either. I, I don't think it's the, um, the knowledge processes, you know, so there are a lot of um, narratives that are needed and a lot of narratives that need to change that we could contribute to, but also the thinking processes, you know, we have methods of inquiry that are helpful and I offer a lot of examples of this in the book. Um, you know, uh, for example, you know, we, we always, um, um, front and center put the variables of time and place uh, in our methods of inquiry. And this helps with uh, one example of that I included in the book was um, uh, a lot of the science around fish oil studies to see if they have any benefits. 
they can't replicate the results. You know, it's very variable and they don't know why. In one study, it will improve kidney health and in the next, um, nothing happens. And, but we know that, that f the fat from that salmon is only medicinal uh, in a certain season and in certain places. You know, so it's where and when you harvest that that's important. You know, so an indigenous, an indigenous lens on things can actually help in general with processes rather than specific knowledge of, you know, where can we find this plant to extract a chemical that we can synthesize and use for something else. And, you know, um, you know, all, all the usual things. Uh, can I get a dream catcher hanging on my wall? <laughs> all that, uh, the little bits and pieces that people like to look at. Um, but the real knowledge is elsewhere. Um, so lately I've been looking at, um, at I mean, mm, like modeling's going to get increasingly important and they need to be, our models need to be grounded in, you know, complexity and knowledge of complexity and systems. And I think that's something that uh, indigenous knowledge can offer a lot to. Um, it was only a few weeks after my book was initially published, I was contacted by a climate scientist who said they'd been sitting on a lot of complex data for a long time, but they couldn't figure out um, how to, how to complete the analysis and then how to present the data. They, they couldn't figure that out. So they were stuck for a long time with that. And apparently they read my book and then somehow the solution was there. <laughs> and so then they were able to create these models. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I've been looking at the agent-based modeling um, recently. And so they sort of build up these little um, kind of software people in these little software landscapes and but they have to evolve them over many generations until they've got you know human-like agents you know in a landscape that then they can introduce different things and run experiments and see where things are going to end up uh, which is pretty exciting but i find they often start off um so they start off making their computer people their software people they start them in a hunter-gatherer phase um, with some very simple <laughs> operating protocols, you know, and they just kind of throw them out into a landscape of infinitely regenerating resources where nothing needs to be put back into the land or anything like that. And they just have these um, marauding little computer nodes just, just running around completely self-interested and individual and, um, you know, fighting each other and... <laughs> And running around the place and they call that the hunter gatherer stage um but really i mean it's just wrong story a lot of the baseline data that all of our disciplines are based on in the academy is based on a wrong story about a paleolithic past so there are a lot of assumptions about human beings motivated by these binaries of you know fight or flight and you know pleasure and pain and you know and more, most importantly domination and submission and that we're all out for ourselves in this game theoretical nightmare <laughs> sort of world where we need this civilized law and order imposed. And otherwise, we'll just, you know, oh, and it's, you know, this, it's anthropogenic. Everybody's just, you know, self interested little beasties running around and wrecking the planet like it's our individual fault or our communities, you know, with our selfish eating and washing. <laughs> um, like, but as we know, you know, communities only use 10% of the water. The rest of that is done by industry, you know, which is very wasteful of, of water, you know? So, um, I don't know, as everybody keeps telling us to tighten our belts with things like water usage and stuff like that, we need to be looking to see where all that wastage is actually occurring. We need to have a right story about people because an agent based, you know, modeling program that was actually uh, grounded in, in the real social organization of indigenous people, you know, which is all of us, our pasts, you know, in this paleolithic past that, you know, um, was not like they say, you know, science tells us that 30% of people before agriculture were killed in homicides. And I'm still asking for that data set of how they arrived at that. You know, I think there are a lot of flawed assumptions and very flawed narratives about our past um, that are, are not very scientific and that really don't have any place in the sciences. 
and they certainly shouldn't be there as the baseline data upon which we're building models of human behavior so that we can somehow predict um, the irrational swarming behaviors of human beings um, as if it was just those actors running around in the landscape um, that were creating all of these problems. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, particularly climate change. Um, you know, I, at the moment, Australia is about to enter a phase of becoming a gas economy, apparently. So we're, um, you know, uh, apparently gas is, is regarded as a, um, as a clean, you know, fossil fuel that is, you know, going to be good for climate change and all that sort of thing. Um, it's going to have less carbon emissions. Unfortunately, though, it does emit something that um, extends the shelf life of, of methane, which is arguably worse than carbon. <laughs> so it, um, you know, in, methane breaks down eventually in the atmosphere, but when you burn a lot of gas, um, that actually, you know, uh, halts that process and, you know, uh, gives the, um, the methane a, a massive half-life that sort of keeps going. So, I mean, all these little measures that we do, we always tinker on this sort of cause and effect relations logic. Um, whereas the more holistic uh, systems understanding of indigenous people, I think would, um, uh, would really help with everybody's modeling, um, everyone's predictions and of, you know, engineering solutions that are, that are multifaceted and that, um, you know, are actually working, you know, with uh, complex knowledge within complex systems, you know, uh, to create the kind of emergencies that we need. Um, we also need to be leaving things behind uh, for the people who are coming next. And um, those people are going to have a tough time because they'll be on a thousand year cleanup. So what are the tools that we need to leave for them? I'd like to leave that question out there for everybody on this panel. What are the tools we're going to need to leave um, for the people who are coming after us, um, who are going to have to be spending a thousand years in transition, uh, doing it really tough and on this cleanup. And that's the best case scenario. I did take talk to David Suzuki recently, last week it was, and he was just like, nah, it's over. <laughs> it's finished. We're past the tipping point. It's done. Um, nothing to be done now. Um, <laughs> he just said, you know, it's, um, yeah, it's finished in terms of the climate and everything else. And, you know, basically the only place this is going to go is in a massive global, you know, conflict and revolution. And a lot of people are going to die. And I guess when you hear a really happy fella like David Suzuki, <laughs> with his first book I read, he was smiling and like naked on the front cover. And now he's a very, very angry grandfather. Um, sitting there is pretty much given up hope um that's a pretty that's a pretty terrifying place to be working from um, but we have to do the work anyway because we have to leave something behind good story cautionary tales and cognitive tools for the people to clean up after that's it thank you so much um tyson for um as usual your profound uh, thinking and your ability still to find a wry smile. Uh, that's an excellent question that you've put out there. I'll, I'll def we'll definitely come back to that in our discussion. It's obviously probably the most important question. Um, we're now going to move to uh, Christine, Christine MacDougall, who, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, is the founder of Syntropic Enterprise. Christine, can you explain how you know, what's the, the idea behind Syntropy and how you think it might be able to provide some of the answers that we are looking for in this thousand year cleanup? Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Cindy, and thank you, Tyson. And um, uh, first of all, I would like to um, pay my respects. Um, I am standing on Yukon Bear Country um, as um, a beautiful part of Spaceship Earth. And um, I would also like to acknowledge the, um, the ancestors of this land, but also the ancestors 
uh, of um, that have enabled me to stand here, um, including the work of Bucky Fuller, which um, um, has been my main mentor, and all of those people um, that have given um, the opportunity to, for me to have a voice. And at the same time, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the people that um, have paid the ultimate price, the exploited, the colonised, both um, in the past and also currently existing on the planet right now. Um, it is exploitation of Earth, um, her creatures and humans, and the colonisation impulse that um, I have, that has um, been the sort of like key generator function behind my work. And finally, I would like to speak to the future because, um, uh, and sort of on Tyson's sort of ending point, uh, I made a decision a couple of years ago to dedicate my life to the future that we can create rather than trying to change um, anything that we currently have. And so that's, that's really how um, Centropic came to be. But let me sort of go back. So when I was, a 26 year old, bright eyed and bushy tailed as so many of us could potentially be at age 26, um, out of just uh, exited out of six years of applied medical science at university. I went to a, uh, uh, an event to learn how to make a lot of money. Uh, and I actually inadvertently um, was introduced to the work of Bucky Fuller. And that really changed my life. And so for people who are not familiar with Bucky's work, um, he had actually passed by the time I was introduced to his work. But um, one of the key words that captivated me um, was his conversation about integrity. And in the world that we're living right now, I think that conversation uh, needs to be had a lot more frequently by a lot more people, um, not only had, but also um, enacted. The other thing, um, the other element of Bucky that was really profound for me was he, con he considered, and I'm going to take you back in time to 1927. I certainly wasn't around, and I'm pretty sure no one here on this call was around at that time. But in 1927, I could well imagine that uh, we were just building roads and petrol stations, gas stations, and so on, because the automobile was a new, new feature. And Bucky determined that he, he wanted to understand the all-in cost of a barrel of oil. And so the all-in cost is taking into account the cost for Earth, Mother Earth, to create our oil fossil fuels over millions of years. That's one part of the cost. Then there is the cost for humans to find it, refine it, extract it, transport it, use it, all the stuff that we generally put on a balance sheet in our current models. And then there is the post-use cost, which um, people often refer to as pollution or, you know, we could CO2 in the atmosphere, whatever you want to call it. Bucky called that stuff out of place or stuff out of integrity that had not been thought of. And so, he determined in 1927 that the all-in accounting cost of a barrel of oil was so high that there wasn't a single human on the planet that could afford a single barrel. And he said that eventually we would be paying the after tax of our lack of consideration of the all-in cost. And Tyson, of course, just mentioned a thousand years um, that we would be cleaning up after ourselves. And so this is one of the elements. And so it was this type of thinking that really tipped me as a young person. And, um, you know, there have been times that I've cursed Bucky um, as well as celebrated because it set me on a pathway uh, where um, he, he dedicated his life to understanding uh, the laws, what he called the laws of universe. Uh, and he was committed to applying those laws to uh, designing things like homes and cities and infrastructure and cars and so on and so forth uh, that took into account um, the all-in cost 
that apply these principles, uh, such as, you know, creating houses 70 years ago that would run on almost no water uh, and very little electricity and, and so on and so forth. So is he, that was his type of thinking well and truly in advance of um, pretty much anyone's thinking. Um, but he also challenged every single system, um, including our governance system, um, how we do enterprise, limited liability corporation and so on, which was created uh, 420 years ago, part of the East India Company. Um, and, you know, that when I was a young person, I never considered, you know, what is the, the, um, you know, if you're going to create a business and you're going to have a limited liability corporation, what actually are you animating in that action? And what is a limited, what is limited liability? And why would we choose to do that? Um, who, you know, and, and then create a whole legal code that has wrappings of protection and so on around it um, that uh, means that you can go and do terrible things and walk away scot-free. And so, um, in his book, um, Critical Path, which was written in 1983, I think, um, he, on page 82, he actually says, eventually the taxpayer will be bailing out the big corporations. Um, and so, of course, we're very familiar that that happened. So Bucky's work inspired me and has inspired me. I've been apply, an applied student of his work um, all my life. But what I've done to it is I've applied it to... Um, uh, enterprise design and human coordination. Because, you know, a large part of his work was studying geometry. And geometry is the study of relationships. And I love bringing people together. You know, it's one of the things that I love. I love bringing incredibly dedicated people who care about something, bringing them into a space to work together on, on this idea that they want to generate um, for a world with a future. And for 30 years, I, I did this, but it always ended up falling into what I call a messy human heap. So in other words, all the human relational dynamics, which I'm sure everybody on this uh, call has experienced a messy human heap of some form or other, um, it often falls into this sort of stuff, you know, our ego, our, um, our wanting to be the best, the win, lose, you know, all of that sort of stuff that is part of, of our, our humanity gets in the way of this impulse to create something um, that we deeply care about for a world with a future. And so um, in 2015, I um, held an event on, in my local community um, called Big Blue Sky, and um, which the whole purpose behind it was to how do you bring uh, a community together under one roof to co-create a viable future for our city. And the event itself was profoundly successful. But one of the things that was um, even more successful was I created finally um, an enterprise architecture, a structure that we got incorporated into the legal trust of that enterprise that enabled a group of 12 strangers to come together and over six months co-create a world-class event without a single human upset and entirely self-managed. And it was literally like watching a symphony play without a conductor. It was just this extraordinary experience. And one of the things that Tyson again referenced was the process, you know, and, and um, Nora Bates and the warm data, the, the in-between stuff of relationships. Um, the invisible, weightless, immeasurable um, metaphysical gravity that um, Bucky talked about, which he also called love, uh, which uh, enables a group of people to come together and co-create something and do so in a way that brings out the very best of us as um, individuals, but working together in community. And so um, only about a year ago, um, I made a decision, it was probably two years ago, I made a decision that I was going to dedicate the rest of my life to creating a world with a future. And there were sort of three key pieces to this. There was a quote, which was from Bucky Fuller, which is, don't try and change the existing model. 
build new models that make the existing obsolete. And so I was very tired of trying to fix the broken um, or rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic or auction off the best seats on the Titanic or you know, any of that sort of stuff. And, and I, there was just a, a commitment that how do we turn to the future that we can create? Because most of the human systems that we have, in, and I'm going to say in the Western world, you know, in the, the, the current model of our economy and so on that we're working with every day, are human constructed. And what they do is they deny um, the laws of universe, um, um, the law, L-O-R-E, the law of the land. They deny... Um, laws that have been working um, beautifully and in harmony uh, for you know billions of years and so how do we create that do we have the capacity and the ability to turn and apply these laws to how we do things together as humans and use the the all-in accounting consideration the processional effects the long-term effects and so on of what we're doing the question, how do we do that? So the quote was, don't try and change the question. And the daring is that um, to rethink everything. And so it goes back to, again, what Tyson sort of mentioned, that we have to, um, that the stories that we've been telling ourselves and the stories that I, you know, even still to this day, but have bought that never question, you know, like, like, the legal and the governance structures and the way and what is money and how do we have currency and uh, and um, how do we consider value and how do we honor different types of values in humans and so on so it's really about questioning everything and you know i really really believe that when we um when we do this and when we take the wisdom that has been the indigenous and the land wisdom and the nature's wisdom and so on um, and apply that to some of the thinking like bucky fuller's thinking and so many other people uh and then create the ecologies the environment that enables these ideas to really come to life, uh, that we then evoke one of the greatest um, laws um, and, and in Bucky's sort of code, the first principle, we evoke the law of synergy, which literally means that um, the human mind working in an ecology that has enabled synergy, um, the exponential capacity of individuals working together synergistically uh, is um, cannot be estimated. Uh, and so, but there are a particular set of agreements and formulas, um, formulas or structures, you know, the architecture that is required for that to happen. Uh, anyone on the, um, who's ever tried to create a garden, you know, it, it, it knows that the this whole lot of things, you've got to get the soil and, and put the time and attention into that. You've got to consider the environment. You've got to nurture, you've got to steward, et cetera, et cetera. These are the elements. And so how do we do that from the point of view of enterprise? And so just in closing, some of the key pieces that we have, you know, we consider synergy. It's absolutely built on a backbone of integrity. Um, we consider a completely different way of looking at value um, in six domains where money is only one of those um, domains. We look at um, steward leadership. Um, Tyson talked about custodial. It's a very similar. It's just the stewarding capacity versus um, a hierarchical type of leadership. We consider clean communication and we're always looking at this evolutionary purpose um, towards a world with a future. Thank you, Cindy. Sorry about that. Thanks very much indeed, Christine. That's um, you know, a, a fascinating theory. I know it's, it's hard to fit it in 15 minutes, but hopefully we can dive into more depth in the Q&A. And on that note, um, for everybody who's joined us today, if you would like to, we're moving on to our last uh, panelist, Angus Forbes. If you'd like to start asking your questions, you can use the Q and A um, function at the bottom of, that you'll find at the bottom of your your screen, and we'll try to answer as many of questions 
as we can. Um, so without further ado, I'll hang over to Angus, who has two years ago founded the Global Planet Authority and is now saying that the time is ripe for humans to move into global governance of the biosphere. Thank you very much, Angus. Well, thank you, Cindy, and uh, thank you, Christine, and thank you, Tyson. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to be the only one using slides. Uh, so I've got 15 slides uh, in, to show you in 15 minutes. So we're going to be quite quick. But my brain works that way. So excuse me if we move straight to slides. And hopefully I can do this. Mm -hmm. And now I just need to play it. Okay. Hopefully you can see that, Cindy, you can nod if you can see that, all right. Thank you very much. So really I'm extending an invitation to us all um, to go somewhere that humanity has never been before. And that is the void that is global governance. And the reason why uh, I feel so strongly we need to do that and why so many academics are, are saying that is that it's just a natural line of fit we're one race, we now run a planet for the first time in our human history with mother nature. So let's afford the very best outcome. Let's put in place a specialist protectorate whose only job is to protect a biosphere now and for the next 1,000 and 2,000 years. I think if we landed if 7.6 billion of us landed on planet Earth today and we, we, we said, oh my goodness, this is the most extraordinary planet that we've found in the universe. This is just perfect, 14.2 degrees um, average surface temperature. We can breathe, there's rainforests, there's whales. We were just arrived here. So let's put forward ideas on how to protect this planet as we live here, you'd find it very difficult to imagine that the best idea we could think of is to divide it into 195 different countries. I mean, it sort of blows your mind, right? And that they are competitive, hegemonic. They're not full-time specialists at looking after a biosphere. They're compromised because they have to provide human goods and services at the same time. They're geographically, geographically constrained. They're mistrustful and cheating. They spend no money on the environment. And basically, they're rank amateurs. So we have a system that we have built which just doesn't fit our times. 195 rank amateurs. And the result of that, because we release so much force, is that we have a biosphere, which I put on a netball court or on a football field that looks like this. I have air at the top, on the left, forests and biodiversity, the fresh water and ocean water at the bottom, and I put soil and the fixed nitrogen cycle on the right. I mean, it's a, it's a complete and utter disaster. That's, we all know that. That's why we're all on this call. Now we've scrambled. The system has scrambled. You know, ever since the, um, the, the, the modern start of the Anthropocene post-Second World War, we've thrown all sorts of airtime at it. But basically, it's just failure after failure after failure. Ever since the, the famous 1972 Stockholm Declaration signed by all nations, all nations signed the Stockholm Declaration 1972, which stated the natural assets of the earth must be safeguarded. And here we are 50 years later, and it's going from bad to worse. This is a structural flaw. It's just not designed to protect a biosphere. So we've got to move on. And I'm afraid the forecasts are terrible. And Tyson alluded to it in rare earth mining, etc. 
These are the forecasts, current forecasts for the biosphere in 30 years time. And we were all shocked, weren't we, by the Living Planet Index. Um, in 2014, WWF um, gave the, um, uh, the statistic for the Living Planet Index at 0.4 and said that, warned that it would get to 0.3 uh, by 2030. Well, it announced a month ago, it was 0.32. So 10 years ahead of time, the Living Planet Index is down to 0.32. This is going all the wrong way. So we have to do something different. Now our forebears allocated their personal sovereignty, they voted and they created structures that were of their time. They created towns, municipal governments, provincial governments like um, uh, Lower Saxony or New South Wales or Quebec. And of course, cities and city governments like Damascus, which is 11,000 years old. And then very recently, we've reduced national governments and nation states. They're very young. 1776 for the United States of America, 1867 for Canada, 1881 for Germany, to 1900 for federal Australia, um, 1947 India, 1965 Singapore. Nation states are very young and they can't control the human environmental nexus. And it's important to note that the UN has no executive power over the nation state. That's why I have it down to the on the right-hand side and below the nation state. The UN cannot say, you must do this, you must do that. It doesn't have that power. So we have to go somewhere that humanity has never been before. We have to enter global governance. And the first thing we should put there is a specialist authority whose sole job is to protect the biosphere with power above the nation state. We think of Putin, Modi, Widodo, Trump, Xi, Biden, but these characters will come and go. Whoever's running nation states, a global planet authority will be above it. Now I also put a, another square there because once we've made the incursion into the space, we'll put other things in there like an authority to, to um, ban nuclear weapons or to look after artificial intelligence. As soon as we go, everything changes because the Global Planet Authority can start to do what's obvious, a global carbon tax, a safe reduction of CO2 from the troposphere. It can take all of the world's rainforests and put them under global protectorate. That's an executive order. It can compensate the nations like Brazil, et cetera, by using monies gained in a global, uh, global taxation system. It can ban global landfill. It can make 60% of our oceans man-free. We can have mobile marine parks going up the east coast of Australia with the migrating whales. So if they're going past the heads of Sydney Harbour, the mobile marine park will go with it and all ships will have to stop entering Sydney Harbour until the whales have passed. As soon as we go global, things will happen. And it will respect the enormity of the human future. There's only been 50 to 70 billion humans alive in the last 10 millennia. The next 10 millennia will probably see 1 trillion humans alive. And I'm afraid our entering into global governance in order to save a biosphere is actually part of a bigger picture because our existential risk profile is absolutely appalling. This is a piece of work by Toby Ord, who's also an Australian and a young academic in Oxford. And he looks at the probability of human induced existential risk. And at the moment, it's a one in 300 chance that we wipe ourselves out in this century. But he and others compute as we go through this century, it'll reduce to one in three. 
because on top of nuclear war possibility, climate change and environmental damage comes even, even bigger problems, engineered pandemics, unaligned AI and dystopian scenarios. So let us use the commonality of climate change and environmental damage to enter global governance as soon as we can. So how do we do this? How do we go? Well, fortunately, there's precedent. Our forebears built everything we see here through exactly the same way that we're going to go, by a vote, by a single action, by an action together. And this is the key slide. We're going to undertake the first act of global self-determination. Because 5 billion of us are now online, and because of our cultural overlaps, this affords us a step change in human agency. And the act that we will take is that two to three billion people will vote in a biometrically valid and secure online vote. And we'll let anyone who's 13 years and older vote. The power that we have is that we are the system. We are the entire system. So we can close down the global economy, which is where COVID is so interesting, of course, because we've had a, almost a forerunner of that. But it's really important to recognize as well how many people actually run and enforce the 195 nation states. And because we're a very efficient species, it's only 50 million people. And that is computed by the 50,000 MPs in the world members of parliament, given, give them 500 senior civil servants each to uphold the operating judicial and executive arms of government. That gives you 25 million, so 25 million governors, and then there's only 21 million soldiers in the world, are the, the enforcers. So 25 plus 21, obviously 46. So there's only 50 million. So there's 5 billion of us and there's only 50 million of them. That's a ratio of 100 to one. 100 of us, one of them. So where does that stand in the famous acts of self-determination of the last 300 years? Right, slap, bang, in the middle. Our global citizenship has just arrived at the average ratio that Washington, Sun Yat-sen, Pankhurst, Gandhi, Mandela recognized of their time. They knew we could go. They knew. And this is why our, our leaders are beginning to emerge. And Tyson mentioned David Suzuki just a minute ago. So just two slides to go. This, I believe, is the most powerful Venn diagram in human history. These will be our leaders who will take us into global governance. We have at the top 2.4 billion women. 2.4 billion women online who can lead, themselves lead humanity into a more peaceful and um, progressive place, that of global governance. 2.6 billion gamers, the most hyper-connected citizens on earth, gamers. 1.5 billion people who are aged 13 to 30, and remember the vote will be for those who are 13 years and older. 2.2 billion online Christian and Muslims. The Pope is very uh, vociferous about the necessity of biophysical integrity. The Muslim faith recognizes that the earth is a, is a, a um, evidence of the creator of their God. And 2.5 billion people of Asian philosophy and faith. The Indus population recognize Ahimsa as the necessity to do no harm to any living thing. And that was something that was advocated by Gandhi. And of course, Confucianism advocates a ritual of ritualism 
um, and that there is a necessity for the human race to have a ritual of care for the, um, for the planet. So it will be the confluence of these five groups that lead us into global governance through the act of global self-determination. And lastly, when is this going to happen? Well, there are four, five, four components to revolutionary change. You need dissidents, you need mass frustration, you need the shared motivation of where you're going, and then you need the shock. The reason why I'm talking about this is I'm a dissident. The mass frustration is looking after itself. The shock is looking after itself. It is one and three that we have to do. We have to bind together in order to enter global governance in the one act. I'm absolutely convinced that we're gonna do it. And that's how we're gonna reduce our existential risk profile. Thank you. Well, thanks very much indeed, um, Angus. It's, um, you know, it's always great to hear you put forward such a powerful vision, something that does indeed seem fully achievable. Um, and thank you to, to you, uh, Tyson, and to um, Christine for such a, you know, for a window. So I'm sorry we have such a short amount of time, but a window into your um, really compelling and vital work. It's such a privilege to know the three of you and to be acquainted with what you're doing in this world. Um, you are indeed all pioneers, which takes tremendous, well, in your case, with tremendous vision, and it takes real guts as well. Instead of tinkering around the edges to shore up a system that is fueling its own demise quite clearly, you've each had the courage to articulate and to dedicate your lives to building new structures. And it does take guts because pioneering is dangerous. It opens you up to attack, derision, dismissal. But encouragingly, when the bridge is crossed, people scarcely remember that they were ever on this near side. So you know, it gives me tremendous hope. Um, so it feels to me that you're each holding a piece of a map that does indeed outline a way to a world with a future. Tyson, you're illuminating a new way for us to relate to Earth from, a heritage, from the heritage of a culture that's partnered successfully with Earth for over 60,000 years. You know, you're inviting us to really shift our minds. Um, Christine, you're um, developing a code by which we can work together as humans to build our large scale structures aligned to principles that steward and regenerate our life support system, Earth. So it should have as its base a worldview that Tyson outlines. Angus, from the understanding of this need for stewardship, um, you're setting out to put in place a collective global structure by which this is achievable. So there's some questions coming in the panel into the Q&A box now, which is, which is great. We'll, um, we'll take as many of those as we can and, and invite you to please keep bringing them through. I'd just like to start though with a question for, I'll, I'll present it to you Tyson first, the, the panel's welcome to, to contribute. Is the most important step to achieving these things a shift in mindset? Um, Tyson, in your book, you outline a deep flaw that is found across almost all cultures, which is the notion of superiority over, which is incompatible with responsible stewardship um, for Earth. So how do we overcome this? Do you believe this is the starting point and that it's possible to do so? Well, um, yeah, that's that, uh, that kind of uh, narcissistic self-interest thing. And that's... Um, that's something that, that results in a, a, you know, of course you, you would probably all have come across the idea of the tragedy of the commons. Mm -hmm. And that usually comes from one idiot, <laughs> what they call a multipolar trap, you know? Um, and that, you know, the vision of the multipolar world um, that Angus was putting forward, um, it's, it's gonna have to figure out this multipolar trap. Is it all you need is one idiot? Um, to start taking more than they should or misusing those common resources the way they should. And then everybody has to do that in order to remain competitive. We've seen that with um, Australia's race this year to try and install an internet of things in order to remain uh, globally competitive. 
they are aware because I've read all the reports that um, that this represents a significant, you know, environmental problem <laughs> um, just on the e-waste side, not even on the production side of installing 40 billion devices and then increasing that by 4,000% every year thereafter. Um, yeah. And they've just, they've just flagged that that's, that's, that's something that we're going to have to uh, uh, bear in mind is the environmental costs as we go along, but they have to do it because if they don't, they'll be out competed by the rest of the world. And we'll, um, you know, just end up being a, a convict outpost at the bottom of the well. <laughs> oh, hang on. We already are. That's right. Um, you know, yeah. So there's multipolar traps need sorting out. And I guess it, it's that narcissistic thought that, um, that's been around forever, you know, that needs to be held in check. This suspicion that people start to get that, no, oh, I'm really special. I'm, I'm <laughs> you know, this, this place belongs to, I, I can, you know, all of this is for me, all people exist to serve me, all these resources are mine. And then, um, you know, off we go. And there's, there's the cause of the tragedy of the commons right there. Um, it's really something that we need to deal with. And I guess in, in our way, what we've always had there is, um, is the law of the land. And um, the, the law is in the land. And this is a hard thing for people to get their heads around unless they think about it in terms of natural law. You know, uh, there are limits and they're in the landscape. And there are maps of story in the landscape too that can make this very explicit to you. But there are limits in the landscape and past civilizations have come up, up against those limits and then collapsed, you know. Uh, so we need to be aware of those because that law is in the land. And I think it's the task of the indigenous peoples of the world to bring everybody else back under that law of the land again. And it's fairly urgent because if we don't do it in the next few years, then um, everyone and everything is going to die. Um, and you can't resolve that with a blockchain to remove those issues of trust and, you know, institutions and all that sort of thing. Um, that, that's not going to do it. Uh, we need to get back to the law of the land again or where, um, yeah, nothing's going to make it. Hmm. Um, Angus or Christine, would you like to, to comment on that question? I have some follow-up questions um, from that, Tyson, but let's... Um... Christine and Angus in terms of the shift of mindset is it possible can we do it um I certainly believe so if Christine if, if I can go first sorry if you're ready to go um yeah I I I think it is I think I think the, the human mind is so incredibly intelligent um we work out efficiency frontiers in a, in a minute you know, um, how long is this call going to go? How long is this quest going to be answered? You know, we're, we're so damn smart. Humans are so smart. They, they you know, the chances of me uh, propagating, what's my next job? Um, uh, you know, are my kids going to be all right? We, we're working these things out every minute of the day. And what I think is that for the modern mind, we haven't heard an answer with regard to the care of the planet. We haven't heard what is the answer? What is sufficient power? We know we've let the cat out of the, you know, can. We know this is a big problem. So we're, what is, what, how do we actually win here? How do we be majestic? Uh, and I believe it is putting in place a, an authority with sufficient power whose sole job is to, is to care for the planet. Um, so, yeah, reimagining the future that we want is absolutely key, but I, I, I really do believe the answer is right in front of us. Christine, would you like to comment? Um, so, uh, you know, the, the question of can we surpass our impulse for superiority um, is a growing up question. <laughs> um, and, uh, and um, all of us, I think, are, are in a stage of growing up. Uh, and to achieve that in the timeline that is required, I'm not entirely sure that we can, quite honestly. <laughs> but I do actually think uh, that um, that the that the impulse, and it, and it goes back absolutely to um, to limits and so on that Tyson mentioned, that the 
what that means is we have to consider how we're how we're supporting and this sort of goes to your work cindy how we're supporting the education of young people to know that they are custodian stewards of earth uh, and that the actions that they take you know in the small in the home has a consequence and uh, that there is this beautiful planet that we need to take care of and and consider and um, and so that unless we really start really taking the time to change a mindset from very early on uh, at the moment it's left to the older people who are not always able to do this <laughs> um, or the younger people who are out there you know um, like the Greta Thunbergs and so on in the world who are actually trying to, to create change um, but yeah you know it's it against forces of many who absolutely thrive from a position of superiority. Mm. As we have just seen in the US, of course, but thankfully kept in check um, for now. There's, you know, the, the, there's so much in your responses. Um, if we have time, I'd really like to come back to what each of you have said that I would like to take a couple of questions from our audience. Um, Next, um, Bethany has asked, um, I'll read Bethany's comment. She said, thank you. As an Australian, I'm sitting in Cambridge and it's great to hear from you all. I'm developing my master's thesis in climate change education. To all the panelists, what do you think is the role of education in the climate change crisis? And to Tyson, based on my literature survey, there is little, if any, research of or recognition of the role of indigenous knowledge in climate change education. How can I, as a white female, ensure that an Indigenous lens is meaningfully applied to my research? So we'll start with you, Tyson, because you had the direct question, and then we'll take it to the panel. Um, I, there, was, there has been a study done fairly recently out of Deakin University um, that was looking, looking into that. You might find, I wish I could remember the name of the, the authors, but the first, or, the first author they put there as the land where they did it. So they made the land itself an author of the paper, um, which is a really interesting thing. It's acknowledging the land as a sentient entity. And I, I just think just it's just a step you take personally. You acknowledge that, that places are sentient, uh, that places are self-organizing systems and that you can connect with those places and you can be in feedback loops with those places and direct your efforts and energies that way. Um, it, as for, um, you know, what can you do as a white woman? O almost nothing without getting your butt kicked. Um, <laughs> white women are probably the most flogged piece of people on the face of the earth right now. Um, and there's nothing that you're going to be able to do right. Um, you, like, especially at the moment, you're going to be Karen, no matter what you do here. Uh, if you don't uh, bring in Indigenous voices into what you're looking at, then you get in trouble and if you do then it'll be like well you know are oh, you appropriating so there's not much you can do i'm afraid um yeah <laughs> it's just uh sorry that i'm laughing it's just it's just such a conundrum um you you, you just yeah you'll you'll just have to experience that uh damned if you do damned if you don't thing for a while uh but then keep your eye on the big prize you know which is that we're all damned um if we don't in the end <laughs> Um, yeah, and just, you know, take one for the team, I guess. Um, do what your heart tells you and what your place is telling you to do. A call to courage, Bethany, and to be a pioneer yourself. You know, was, I love that. Um, well, I don't know why I love it, because I feel like you, you can tell the pioneers because they're the ones with the arrows in their backs. So, um, yeah. Um, uh, Angus, would you like to comment on the, the, the question? It's to all the panelists. What do you think of the role role of education in the climate change crisis? Well, thank you. I mean, clearly it's completely vital. Um, I do think that education comes in multiple forms, and I think that the education system of the world is, is being turned upside down right now. So the mobile phone and the internet, obviously, is, is you know, just changing uh, people's um, ability to educate themselves so rapidly. So I, um, 
you know, the the base load for my work, that is that we are one race running, running a, a, a one planet, um, is, you know, and I cited in that slide you might have seen, obviously, Carl, um, Rachel Carson, um, you know, the, the, that knowledge that we are now running uh, ecosystems um, is absolutely key. Um, and I think that it's, I think that it's, people know that now. I do, you know, I, I, I people, I'd really do, people say, oh no, they haven't been educated. Well, my, my 16 year old daughter, she came home from school the other day and she said, dad, uh, it's really sad. And I said, what do you mean? And she said that we've got seven years until we pass the tipping point. It's my 16 year old daughter. She learned that in her ecosystem uh, science unit at school. But equally, someone who's in Kerala, who's just got, whose friend's got a mobile phone, will see um, a Time magazine uh, front cover or whatever with, you know, a polar bear on an iceberg, you know, a small shrinking iceberg. So I think the, uh, or you'll be in Mumbai facing a wet bulb um, moment of humidity and heat, or you'll be a lack of fish, the, as Tyson said when he went up to one of his boyhood um, places uh, of, of rainforest um, we we all feel the biosphere we all we all know that it's um, not where it should be so education uh, is key um, and the, um, and that reinforcement that we are in a very bad place is is imperative for our progress um, thanks Angus uh, Christine what's your view of that question well, I thank you. Um, and I was thinking I had the good fortune of being able to think about this some um, answer. Um, you know, one of the, and it sort of goes back to the superiority thing, one of the mythologies that we have as humans is that we're separate and apart from. And, uh, and so, uh, it, um, which is completely a, an illusion. You know, there's nothing that a single person can do that doesn't have, um, doesn't engage life and earth and everything in general um, um, and so we are literally into beings and and not separate and so that the, the sort of like the, the source code of any form of education from very early on is uh, that we are earth and we are soil and we are the land and uh, and uh, we you know this is the custodian steward partnering relationship uh, and so anything that doesn't have us get our fingernails dirty <laughs> and mud between our toes and um, to feel the rain on our face and, and, and so on and have us um, connect with, with earth is going to fail in the end. Uh, and, you know, so there's that, that um, you know, that. And the thing that I would say to Bethany um, is... Uh, is uh, to sort of counter the, the 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 white woman, just go for it. You know, the, the, there's a there's a long arc of history here, and it and um, and it requires people to to step into that. So um, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Christine. I think it is about having courage now. As I said in my earlier comment, if you if it is in your heart, act. Now we're out of time to consider really whether it's the, not the right or the wrong thing to do but the consequences we can see what the consequences of not acting are so act i'm going to take another question from the um, audience this one is from eileen the impact of so many humans on the environment takes two major forms consumption of resources such as land food water air fossil fuels and minerals um, waste products as a result of consumption such as air and water pollutants toxic materials and greenhouse gases there was no discussion or mention of limiting human population. What are your thoughts on this approach? And um, Christine, should we start with you for, for this? It means you don't have time to think, so you'll just have to go for it. <laughs> yeah, no, I've been, I've been well trained in this one. <laughs> um, so, um, and this was one of the things that Bucky really looked at. And uh, he did, um, you know, well before the, the computer um, age, was looking at the numbers around this. And uh, he clearly determined that um, education of women and also the access to um, affordable energy 
clean energy uh, would completely change the birth rate um, in, in favour of um, planet. Um, so in other words, people would have less children. Uh, the, the complexity that lives behind the, um, the population conversation needs to be taken as a whole systems thinking because uh, it's very easy for people um, in our privileged life to say that you know, people should have less children. But in areas where, um, where a whole ecology is built on families of integrated units and so on, um, that's not the option right now. And so there's an elitism that's that, that um, and almost a eugenics that can sneak into this conversation, which is very dangerous. Uh, and so my, yeah, definitely we need less people. <laughs> How we do that though is the question. And for me, that this comes back to some of the large systems. You know, how do we actually um, provide um, the education opportunities um, for girls um, um, and women, but also how, you know, this, this um, the ability for us to take the uh, only nuclear reactor that we need, which is 92 million miles away and, um, and deploy its abundance in a way that is um, uh, completely sustainable and can add an 800% increase in energy to every human on the planet today. And, you know, these questions, if we start asking these questions and, and, and that we can, how do we do this in a way that doesn't have the, um, the rare earth usage and so on and so forth and create more problems. But these are the type of questions that I, you know, we have the capacity to answer if we genuinely, genuinely have the will to ask them. Mm. Which obviously is the whole foundation of your syntropic work where yeah. you bring human beings together to find collectively find solutions based on what each person has to contribute. So yeah, a very interesting way of answering. Tyson, what's your view on uh, the limiting the, the human population? There's a very simple solution to it. Um, and that's um, get rid of the idea of land as capital. Mm -hmm. So stop land from being capital. And you're probably thinking, eh, <laughs> how does that work? Well, it's a bit of a nonlinear uh, concept. But I mean, that's the problem. We're not, um, human beings don't have access to land. We're sort of kept in these sort of little cages, you know, of these, these, these communities on little grids and all that sort of thing. Um, land isn't land anymore. Every square inch of the earth's surface is spoken for. It has all been divided into these enclosures, which become capital that people can borrow against and can be foreclosed on. You know, and so that's the basis of the financial system. Two thirds of the finance in the world, two thirds of the capital in the world is um, is still land based. A lot of people don't know that. Um, and I think if uh, if everybody agreed not to have land as capital anymore, it'd be fine. Mostly because um, most of the people in the world don't have any capital, and the people who are you know really in the bottom fifty percent of that, the only kind of capital that they could ever hope to have is children. Children, for most people in, in, in the world, is the only capital they can have. And so, they'll, of course, in order to survive, uh, they'll have as many children as possible. Uh, that's why poor people breed so much. It's not because they're not educated or anything else. It's because they have to. It's because it's their only chance. The future labor of their children is their only, is their only capital. Um, you know, and that labor is to procure what? The things that the land used to give us for free. Mm. You know, um, so it, it, in order for everyone to come back under the law of the land again, then that law couldn't be capital anymore. That land couldn't be capital. You know, we'd have to, um, we'd have to get rid of that. And I think you'd find that that would sort out um, a lot of the, the problems of the ridiculous financial sort of derivative system that we have as well. Uh, that would sort out all the problems of global debt and all that sort of thing in a different economy would need to emerge by which, you know, people didn't have to use their children, leverage their children's future labor as capital. Mm -hmm. And therefore you wouldn't have people uh, breeding like rabbits. Uh, that's how you solve the population problem. Hmm. Well, it's a very interesting answer. Makes sense. 
uh, Angus, we'll move to you to answer that question. And I wonder what you, um, your, as you know, your former life was dealing in um, <laughs> the debt capital. Well, Tyson, well, first of all, just to say Tyson is absolutely correct with regard to humans' net assets as we describe them in the modern world, capitalist world, are $350 trillion, which is how we account for our net assets. Of course, those are owned by very few people. And that is about $250 trillion of real estate and $100 trillion of market capitalization, gold and art. That's how, that's how we account for them. So your, your number is absolutely right, Tyson. The um, human population question, I mean, just following through my particular advocacy of the Global um, Planet Authority is that I believe that the constitution will be written where they do not have power, um, direct power over uh, human population numbers. Uh, but of course they will be, <clears throat> they will in the name of biophysical protection um, uh, wanting to make sure that we minimize our ultra poor, maximize our education of women and empowerment of women. Um, but I think the, the, it's a natural reaction, isn't it? When you have a structurally flawed model um, of nation states, um, and I come back to nation states because underneath of that, of course, is corporations, underneath that, of course, is the individual, but I come back to, for me, it, it is predominantly a governance issue. When you have the incorrect structure of governance, one that's not working, you immediately look around at the inputs and say, oh, let's remove the inputs because that's causing the problem. We're, there are too many of us, we're over-consuming, we're over-consuming too heavy, light and light and light. And that's true, you need to, we need to, and I love the quote by Marley, Professor Marley of Oxford, who says, who has computed, he and his team have computed natural planetary metabolism. And also, of course, more easily, human industrial metabolism. And they've said that human industrial metabolism has got up to and surpassing natural which leads to atmospheric waste, bio biodiversity loss. So I see it as a glass of water and a glass of full fat Coke. And we have to up the glass of water and we have to rapidly reduce the glass of full fat Coke. And the best way to do that ultimately is through governance to make sure that happens. But I wanna put this human population question and take it forward a couple of hundred years. We all know that 7.6 billion is probably gonna to go to eight, nine, nine and a half would probably top out. The numbers are implying through birth rates that will top out somewhere between nine and 10 billion. But let's imagine humanity in 200 years time. Let's imagine that we've had a pandemic, that there's 5 billion of us, but we're living to now 145 years of age. We're planting AI in our heads. We're doing regular intergalactic mining missions. Whatever the state of humanity is in the future, we need to have a specialist protected authority that cares for planet Earth in whatever state we're in. We being alive at this moment in time are looking at us living to 83 years of age, consuming heavy, but we're gonna change and we're gonna flex and we're gonna change our population dynamics going forward. Un incredibly, things that we cannot even believe. So we need to have a dedicated specialist that cares for the planet 24 seven, every year, every decade, every century going forward. Thanks very much, Angus. We're coming to the end of our um our session, which has been a, a huge privilege for me to, to moderate. I so much appreciate what you all are doing. Um, I want to come back to the question that, uh, that Tyson put out in his presentation to close with, what are the tools we are going to need for the people who come after us? I, I'd just like to say for me, I saw you know, this, this pioneers panel to me holds pieces of that puzzle. Um, we've got this, this altered, mind view we have to uh, find a way of relating to earth which um, 
you know, there's a huge possibility there considering we had it, the indigenous mind has it, it's not lost, it's still there. Can more of us begin to um, understand this, be invited in from, uh, from an early age to develop this mind view? Um, as, as we relate, I don't know how that's done with such a distance between humans and nature now, but it seems that, that there's a baseline that is, is, that is so important for that to happen. And then Christine, you're saying we need to design all our institutions and our, um, our uh, practices from the very individual practices to the, to the corporate practices in, in, in a way that respects the laws of universe. And Angus, you're saying we create an overarching structure that ensures that that, that is done. So to me, I saw some of these tools that, you know, in, in this panel, I've spoken a little bit longer than I, I should have done there. Could I just ask you to you to, to comment on what do you see? And it would need to be a quick comment of the tools that they're going to need for people who come after us. And do you think, well, I won't ask the do you think, what are the tools? Let's end on the positive, not do you think it's possible for us to pick them up and use them? We are going to do that. What are yeah. they? Um, we'll go backwards. We'll go um, Tyson, Christine, sorry, um, Angus, Christine, and we'll finish with Tyson. Angus, you've got a few seconds to answer that. What are the tools? You're muted, Angus. Just unmute yourself, I think. Thank you. It's my apologies. The tool that we need right now is this. It's a mobile phone. This is the tool. This is the action. The action of um, us entering, entering global governance will be, we will look at our screens. We will get a biometrically valid um, uh, code that says, this is me. We'll probably have a retina scan and I'll press my thumb and two other fingers on the screen to ensure that this is me. And I will vote with two or three billion other people uh, in one act to enter global governance. And thereby, we're putting in a specialist tool. That one act is going to put in a specialist tool whose only job is to protect the biosphere. And it will need to change because right now we're, one that we're worried about the degradation of the troposphere. But in 30 years, I promise you, we'll be worried about man-made chemicals. Okay. And then there'll be something we'll be worrying 20 years after that. The, 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 the relationship between... Uh, uh, the relation, this particular relationship between humanity and Earth will now never end. This new era will never end. We are so strong. So we need a specific tool. We need a specific dedicated authority to take charge of that. Okay, thank you, Angus. Uh, Christine. So I'm gonna hold this shape up. Um, this is a tetrahedron. <laughs> uh, and, um, this is the minimum system in universe, but also what it demonstrates, it, in, it demonstrates the one tool that I, um, I think all of us need, um, not only more of, but to practice on a daily basis, and that is integrity, um, which is um, from the um, Latin of integer um, um, one, um, but integrity also means to hold its shape. And so, um, to, to come back to what is integrity, and that is integrity of the individual, integrity of the community, integrity of the land, integrity of spirit, uh, the space between the integrity. Uh, and so integrity is the essence. Uh, and we all, um, the, the deeper that we understand this at an individual and collective level, I honestly don't think without it, we can do anything. Thank you, Christine. And um, Tyson, what are the tools? In well, in, in a nutshell, um, these machines we're using are forcing us into binary logics of we, we have to vote yes or no. Uh, to come into a Zoom meeting, you have to press a bunch of yeses. You have yes, no choices. Um, the machines operate on binary logic systems and, and we're beginning to do the same. Uh, tetrahedral would be better, <laughs> what we saw there, but maybe dodecahedral uh, decision-making processes would also be, be really good. And, um, you know, so I guess um, the most important thing is good sense-making, collective sense-making, um, you know, um, 
uh, mechanisms. And, and I think the answers aren't all in that tech. We're going to need that for transitions, uh, but we're going to have to actually um, innovate ways where these affordances can be achieved in, in sort of a lot more organic ways. Um, and we, we need to find a way to make syndicated diversity work. I'm not sure uh, like a new layer of bureaucracy and we all know how these administrations work is, is the best way to do that. Um, maybe under a fluid democracy model that might work, but um, yeah, no, I, I think we're going to need to return to more, uh, regional governance models, like small via regional community governance models with a lot of, um, you know, anarcho syndicalism and, um, you know, uh, ways of communicating and ways of decision making, you know, in, in these autonomous collectives belonging to larger autonomous collectives. Um, we're going to need to figure out technologies, governance technologies for, um, for getting by that way. Um, yeah, because without that, um, it's it's not going to work. You can't have a planet and a civilization at the same time. Probably need to let go of the idea of saving civilization because you can't have both. But see, that's how it feels to have a binary choice thrust upon you. <laughs> Choose planet or civilization. <laughs> you know, but like I said, there's there's a there's a lot of other options always. There's always a constellation of options, but it takes many minds to do it. Well, that brings us to the end of our um, our session. It's been such a privilege to um, to have to share this time with you. I have to say that you're, I think you're all remarkable leaders. You're you are pioneers at the moment. But I look forward to the day that your way of thinking is the standard way of thinking. I've come. I, remember I have a long history of activism myself. Things that people would have said were absolutely unthinkable. Um, you know, 10 years ago or the, in the beginning of my life are now standard. So I really look forward to seeing you, the three of you as, um, as leaders and the way that you're thinking as principles that are used to take humanity forward, because I certainly think that you hold um, really um, hugely important answers. And I hope that this panel has been an opportunity to have your thinking heard. Um, thank you very much for the people that have joined us today. The, um, the panel will be, is, will be on the Cambridge Zero YouTube site, so please invite your friends and colleagues to tune in and, and listen. And um, the, the picture isn't pretty, but with people like you, panellists, I think that we have an awful lot to, um, to hope for. So I'm sorry I'm going to end on an unforgivably optimistic, an unrelentlessly optimistic note. And um, yeah, look forward to working with you and seeing with you all in, in the very near future. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to the people that joined us today. Thank you. Thank you.